Welcome to Whiskey Lore, The Interviews. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, the Amazon best-selling author of Whiskey Lore's Travel Guide to Experiencing Kentucky Bourbon. And in today's episode, I want to address a statement that I've heard from some bourbon drinkers who say they don't like scotch. Now, to me, that's way too simple a statement to say. I mean, there is a wide range of profiles in scotch whiskey. So my guest today is an American who knows, I'd say, a thing or two about scotch. His name is Ed Cole, and while he was born on this side of the Atlantic, his work as a scotch distributor over the last couple of decades has earned him entrance into an exclusive society known as the Keepers of the Quake. And that society honors those who have been outstanding stewards of scotch whiskey. Now, he not only works as a distributor, but he also does tastings and trainings, all in an effort to help people gain a better appreciation for scotch. Now, I met Ed about a year ago when I was doing my first tours across Tennessee. And on that particular trip, I was actually there to learn more about an American whiskey that he produces called J.W. Kelly, which is named after an Irish-born distiller who set up a distillery in Chattanooga way back in the 1860s. And we had such a great conversation about scotch during that visit that I asked him if he wouldn't mind being a guest on the podcast sometime in the future. So in this conversation, we're going to first dive into his import business and discuss some things that affect how you buy whiskey like the whiskey tariffs and the three-tier system. And the three-tier system is really tricky, and it's part of the reason why, whether it be bourbon, scotch, or whatever, there are some whiskeys that you can't get in certain states. So we're going to talk about that system and the future of it. We'll also dive into a little Scotch 101, talking about smoky versus fruity scotches, We'll talk about which scotch is probably best for a bourbon drinker to sample and kind of dip their toe in the scotch waters. And then we'll talk about regions, buying by age, proof, finishing casks, and how all of these scotches ended up with such a wide variety of styles. we got a ton to cover in this episode, so let's jump right into my conversation with Ed Cole, CEO and Managing Director of Quest Brands. Welcome to the show. Thank you. So you have been an importer of Scotch whiskey for how long? Ooh, um, about 20 years. Okay. And over 20 years, how have you seen the popularity of Scotch and the market open up in the United States? Well, you know, 20 years ago, yes, it was Scotch whiskey was primarily blended Scotch whiskey. Everybody knew that. Uh, People were getting into single malt, but it was a slow start. Uh, And there were a few brands on the shelf, you know, the Johnny Walkers, or I'm sorry, the the McAllens and the the Glenn Levitts and the uh, Glenn Fittics and a few of those guys. But not everybody really understood it and knew it. Mm -hmm. Uh, I kind of fell in love with it when I discovered, wow, what a difference in flavor. Uh, And the difference in the flavors of all the regions. And every distillery had his own style, if you will. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but the popularity has grown over the years, thank God. Yeah, (laughs) so were you a Scotch drinker before you started the import business? Okay. Yep. Yep, always enjoyed Scotch whiskey. And of course, like most people, I was drinking uh, Johnny Walker or Dewar's. I think Dewar's was my probably go-to. Yeah. Um, like the lighter style, um, but eventually discovered Scotch was single malt, and wow, it was quite a quite a eye-opening experience. Yeah, I think a lot of <clears throat> uh, I'm myself included, but I think a lot of people really thought the single malt has just been what's been sold all these years and even today it's still not the primary form of whiskey coming out of scotland you still have more blended scotch sold than you have single malt at this time but that market is is expanding as people become more aware of it yeah and they they talk about uh the total scotch whiskey business um 
80% of all Scotch whiskey consumed in the world is blended Scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. uh, it's interesting enough, the U.S. is the largest uh, by dollar importer of single malt Scotch. Mm -hmm. But who is, what country in the world is the largest consumer of Scotch whiskey? That's an interesting question. By, per capita? Kind of uh, a... Uh, per, per, yeah, per capita. <laughs> who is the largest, largest consuming Scotch whiskey country in the world? Taiwan? No. Nope. No. I was going to say small island, and I know they love their whiskey. <laughs> and they do. France. Ah, okay. I love that. Has a lot to do with the history. Think yeah. Of, think about it. So <clears throat> if you go back to the early, the mid-1800s when phylloxera infected all of the vineyards in France, mm -hmm. killed all of the vineyards, right? Uh, we had a lot of uh, thirsty uh, Frenchmen. And there was guys like Johnny Walker and Mr. Dewars and a few of those individuals who, Hagen Hagen, and a couple of those guys that were uh, just willing to go down there and feed those thirsty Frenchmen. And that began the Scotch whiskey business. See, now you've added a whole nother layer to the story because I did this uh, podcast episode around Bloxera and talking about how cognac was really saved by a root from Texas that was grafted on to save those uh, those vines. But it was really, because there's always been that theory that the upper crust in London and England were enjoying their brandy. And then when phylloxera happened, that's how scotch became popular was because of that, um, uh, because of that epidemic. And yet it, you're giving the other side of it that France was in the same boat and really didn't think about the fact that yeah. you know they are missing their spirit and so when we talk about France and their whiskey industry because I have heard that there are a lot of distilleries in France and that France is a large consumer of whiskey and I say why don't we see any of it here I see one brand right that has made it over from France right. and Otherwise, I, I guess, are they concentrating in Europe mostly or just in France? Well, again, I, I think it's a lot of the history, um, you know, between the cognac producers, uh, the brandy producers um, who are trying to protect their business, uh, mm -hmm. Armagnac, mm -hmm. uh, certainly trying to protect their business. Um, not that they don't like malt whiskey. They certainly do. But... You know, you just look at the uh, supply issue. Um, for them to buy bulk whiskey from Scotland is probably a lot less expensive than it is to try to produce this stuff themselves. Yeah. A new distillery and start it all up and get involved in all the things that are, it's going to take. Yeah. Um, but if it, you know, back then when all that happened, that was about the time that the uh, continuous still was being developed. Mm. And all of a sudden, the, the Scots learned that, wow, you can make all this inexpensive whiskey with the continuous still. And of course, the Irish were going, they were poo-pooing that. They were saying, <laughs> no, 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 we don't like that. We're not going to do that. Well, the Scots embraced it. And of course, that became a, a, a big thing. And, pretty much one of the reasons why scotch overtook Irish whiskey. Yeah, it's interesting to see how the the Irish sort of pushed the Scots in a direction and then it ended up coming back in, in the long run. So um, History is interesting. It is, it's very interesting. So what is the first whiskey that we have to thank you for in your importing business for bringing over to the U.S. market? Well, I happened to meet a gentleman. Uh, I was a broker. Uh, as a brokerage company, uh, I met a guy by the name of Andrew Symington. Mm -hmm. And Andrew Symington had and owned Signatory. And he was looking for an importer over here in the U.S. I wasn't importing at the time. So I said, and we met, and, and I was... Uh, I was the guy's broker, so I, we were going around calling on accounts. 
And he said, Ed, I'm, I'm looking for an importer. Can you help me out? And that was when I started in the business with tying myself up with a couple of importers. Mm -hmm. We lined the importer up, got things going, um, and basically launched uh, Signatory in the U.S. Okay. Yeah. And Signatory, they're, they're more of a bottling. They're not uh, related to a <coughs> particular distillery. Is that correct? Well, no. They uh, are. It, it would have been, I think it was 2001, I believe. Uh, Andrew bought Edward Hour. Oh, okay, okay. So he owns Edward Hour. Yeah. And when that happened, it just propelled him to a whole nother level. Uh, because as a, as a distiller, you have now stock to be able to trade for other casts mm. that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that helped his, his signatory business. Okay. Because he did his signatory is not a distiller. Yeah. What they're doing is they're they're a, they're they're getting these casts and they're bottling it up under the signatory label of distilled at Linkwood or Talisker or wherever it happens to be. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But it's those single casts that are unique and different. So is he the one we have to thank for Edwardar has a great reputation at, oh, yeah. at this point. So yeah. He bought that from Pernod Ricard. Ah. And the day they did that, I was over there when, when the key was exchanged. The president of Pernod Ricard gave Andrew the key to mm. the distillery. Oh, wow. And I still have pictures of that. Uh, and it was, it, everybody was celebrating it because that was the day the distillery came back into Scottish ownership. Mm. So did this start your uh, your travels over to, to Scotland, and, uh, or were you already previously traveling over there for things? I was over there uh, probably uh, another two or three years prior uh, just to see the system and, and talk to some of these distillers, understanding why in the world would they release cash to Andrew? Mm -hmm. It didn't make any sense. Yeah. I mean... Their, it's their cast. <laughs> why, why would they do that? Well, it had, it's stock. Yeah. I mean, they're trying to, they've, they've got to turn over cash flow just like everybody else does. It's and so you've got extra uh, casts, you, you sell them if you, if you can sell them. Yeah. Well, it's interesting in the U.S. that we, we <clears throat> see sort of repetition of what has happened over in Scotland happening over here. Now you have a lot of yeah. companies that are starting to bottle other people's, yep. they're finishing, they're doing other finishing really kind of started over in, uh, in Scotland and now it's making its way into the bourbon world and American single malts and the rest. So sure. it's, it, this is why when I do my podcast, I say, I can't just do a bourbon podcast. I can't just do a Scotch podcast because they're all interconnected yeah. in one way or another. History can't be told without hitting both sides of, of the Atlantic and, and even around the world, as we see with, with France. Sure. So, yeah. And Japan. Yeah. So um, so have you had to deal with the three-tier system all along through all of this? Yes. Yeah. And so I think a lot of people hear three-tier system, and they, they're, they're frustrated because they can't get particular whiskeys in their state, but they don't understand why. Can you sort of explain yeah. the three-tier system? <clears throat> well, by federal law, when, when prohibition was repealed, um, the U.S. government imposed the three-tier system, which, was, which basically said, uh, we'll grant you, th there's three licenses that, that are available. And a producer or an importer, that's one license. Mm -hmm. uh, a distributor, that's another license, or a retailer or a restaurateur, that's another license. You can have two of the three, you can't have all three. Oh. And that's what broke everything up. Okay. And that was the purpose. It was to keep organized crime, which was heavily involved in the alcohol business prior to prohibition, mm -hmm. right? Uh, they wanted to keep organized crime out, so they broke it up that way. So today, I'm an importer and I have an importer's license. I can get a distributor's license if I chose. Yeah. I'm not going to, Yeah, but, yeah. but I could do that. So one of the problems that you run into 
it gets a little more complicated because it's you've got open states mm -hmm. and you have control states. Mm -hmm. Now, open states, Tennessee or Missouri or California. Okay, that's an open state. <clears throat> I can sell to any distributor. Uh, they can buy any product that they want to buy mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and make it available to the retailer. Uh, control states, Pennsylvania, Wyoming, Montana, Oregon, <laughs> there's a bunch of them. Yeah. Um, now the state controls the, the, the alcohol and they're only going to bring in what they think is going to sell. Yeah. So they're only looking at just the big brands, mm -hmm. high volume. They're not going to mess around with things like Smokehead or little stuff like this. They, they, they don't want to bother with that. Yeah. That's and and it even breaks down even further because I grew up in North Carolina, where North Carolina is a very firm control state. But the advantage to North Carolina is that if you get a really rare bottle, bottle like a Pappy Van Winkle or something like that, that mm -hmm. that is getting its price elevated everywhere else, they're selling it at an MSRP in North Carolina. So there there's an advantage to it, but it. It's minimal. It's more of a, uh, it's torture for me because I live in South Carolina and South Carolina is a little looser, but right. we, I still have to go to Kentucky or Tennessee to really find the whiskeys that yeah. I want. Sure. Because here it's, it's much more open than, and not just because it's whiskey country, but because it, it, it is open and, right. and more available that way. The problem we're having today, though, is, <clears throat> and we've seen this through the COVID uh, reaction, the big companies are really beginning to control uh, almost the whole system. For small producers and small companies to get into um, the market uh, through a distributor, mm -hmm. finally to the retailer, and then finally to the consumer, is becoming much more difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, companies, you know, the big, the big massive distributors, uh, Southern Glazer, RNDC, I mean, they, they control just about everything. Yeah. And it's very difficult to get into some of those markets. We're still not in Florida, as an example. Wow. And Florida is a huge market. It would be a great market to be in, yeah. It's a huge market. Yeah. Um, we get requests all the time for some of our products, but you've only got a couple of distributors and they're the big massive guys and they're just not they're not gonna bring you in it's like trying to find a cuban cigar you have to, you have to go out of yeah. state to yeah. go be able to legally get something yeah that's crazy I, the part of me <clears throat> thinks that you know organized crime was something that was a hotbed issue all the way up into the 80s but now it's really not talked about as much is there ever a chance that this three-tier system finally gets looked at as ridiculous and the either the distillers or distributors or somebody probably the, dis the distributors wouldn't fight for it because the, they're actually being fed business uh, because they have to be in the chain well it's interesting because um I've just read recently uh, in some of the newsletters that have been put out that the uh, Biden administration is wanting to take a look at this. Oh, okay. Which should be interesting. Well, and they're also the ones that push to get the tariff at least temporarily removed. I don't think they, they permanently have, have removed that tariff. Um, no, they haven't. Uh, we certainly hope that it's going to be a permanent thing. Yeah. Well, as with the um, issue that the craft distillers had for a long time with that that uh, tax break they were getting ha looming over their head and they finally made it permanent, which right. now you can relax. It's, it's It just leaves you in that constant state of, you know, how far ahead can I plan before the law changes and snaps me up again? Well, the only problem with that is there's a little caveat to that. Mm -hmm. You're limited to the gallonage. So if you produce a certain, over a certain gallonage, the tax goes back up. Okay. So you have to stay. And it's not the limits of what craft distillers' no. limits are because they're really high, actually. I was shocked at how many gallons a, a craft distiller could put out. 
in a year and still be considered a craft distiller. I think it's a hundred thousand. Yeah. 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 That's that's not small. That's like American small business. We say it's a small business, but I mean, as we found out when they started dishing out PPP checks, that small businesses can be quite large. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. Um, so talk about the tariffs a little bit and has it we've seen it because as consumers because we go to the store and for a long time it seemed like we kept waiting for the prices to go up and in most places they still stayed down for a while thinking that's probably the old stock that is still in the area and they're not shipping new stuff over but i saw the price elevate early this year so um how is that affecting what what you're doing? Well, pr- prices the, uh, the big companies held their prices. Uh, they just absorbed mm. those taxes. Mm-hmm. Um, it's gotten to the point now where they can't absorb it anymore. But the taxes are now by taken off. But where that it didn't affect the big guys, it affected the small people. Mm. That was the one that really took it on the chin. A spay distillery. I've had several conversations with them. Uh, even Ian McLeod, as is, is, is large as they are, they, they felt the pressure. Mm. So <laughs> tariffs don't work. Yeah. They don't work. Yeah. Um, it's tit for tat. Um, I raise it. The next guy raises it. Well, I'm going to raise it again. The next guy raises it. It, it doesn't work. Well, I think what Amer- a lot of Americans don't realize that they feel the effects of the tariff on Scotland, but over there, when I travel over there, I see Jim Beam, Jack Daniels, nothing else in terms of American whiskeys. Maybe Buffalo Trace here or there, but the tar- they have a tariff over there, had a tariff on bourbon as well. So <laughs> what we're doing is we're just shutting down the ability yeah. in, a, in a globalized world to be free with... Um, you know, getting people interested in different types of whiskeys beyond their own. I have J.W. Kelly in the U.K. Do you? Yeah. Okay. And J.W. Kelly here, the old Milford, will sell for under $30 a bottle. Okay? Okay. Over there at 60 Yeah. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's stupid. Yeah. Well, it's... And the... It doesn't look like they're. Good. it's going to change right away. Yeah. Well, so in terms of um, talking about scotch, I wanted to kind of use this opportunity because you do training Mm -hmm. and you help people understand scotch. And I don't know how many times I bump into bourbon lovers who say, I hate scotch. (laughs) And I go, so that's kind of like saying I hate food because... There's so many different types of food. How could you say, I don't, you know, if you don't like something that's uh, salty and meaty, you may like something that's fruity and sweet. And so when you're talking about Scotch whiskey, they, I don't think they realize that there is a range. And usually what I hear is that, well, it's too smoky for me. And then I have to explain that not all scotch is smoky. In fact, probably the majority of it is not smoky. Mm -hmm. Um, And and so, but again, I hear that same thing overseas where people say, I don't like bourbon. And I say, what have you had? Jim Beam, Jack Daniels. Well, you know, you're really only tasting some mass produced whiskeys that even, you know, Americans buy them too, but they're kind of considered low to mid shelf products we have stuff that elevates above that uh even with jack daniels there's other stuff that Mm -hmm. you're probably not getting to to taste so um so i wanted to kind of open this up and start talking a little bit more about scotch in general helping the bourbon drinker maybe understand where to start so if you were doing a laying out a flight of whiskeys uh, for somebody to taste, whether your own or or another, like a good starter whiskey for a bourbon person. Yeah, well, when I do tastings, I usually will taste anywhere from six to eight malts, okay? Mm-hmm. 
And we always start off with the lightest one, which typically is going to be a lowland. Mm -hmm. So lowland malts, Okintoshin, um, uh, Linkinchi, these are malts that are very approachable. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons is they triple distill. They're the only region that triple distills. Mm -hmm. Now the reason is their water tends to be a little softer, whereas they're not going to get that real minerally style water that you get up in the highlands. So a lot, all those things kind of play in. So that's a lighter malt. We start there and then we start moving through up into the heavier style until you finally wind up with the Isla whiskeys. And I, I always get a kick out of it every time I talk to somebody who makes the same comment, well, I, I don't like single malt scotch whiskey. I, I don't like it. It's, it's too smoky. Well, what have you tried? Uh, yeah, I had a Laphroaig. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, you probably aren't going to like that. Yeah. Uh, have you ever tried an Okintoshin? Uh, what's that? Okay, well, then you ex start to explain it. And the taste difference between that, that, it's one thing, you know, I've had people come to me after a tasting and they'll say, well, you get big differences with bourbon. Mm -hmm. well, well, of course you do. And there is definitely differences in the, in the different producers and the flavors and the styles and all that stuff, but you don't get the breadth of flavor profile mm -hmm. and differences that you do in single malt scotch. Yeah. Everything from light and fruity all the way to smoky and peaty and iodine -y. Yeah. Uh, and everything else in between. It's, it's fun actually to talk to American distillers because many of them have a secret love for scotch whiskey and will admit that bourbon kind of keeps them locked into a tighter range of flavors and it's harder to bridge out but you're starting to see some of the like angel's envy when they first started finishing a bourbon and you know getting some different character to that whiskey and a lot of distillers here are starting to do that but um in a way Scotland, with all of the different regions, kind of has has developed different profiles that now seem to be kind of spreading out. Like you can get peated whiskeys in the the Highlands sure. again, um, but they're different. And so, talk about peated whiskeys. We'll start at peated. We'll do do it backwards. We'll start at the peated whiskeys, then we'll move towards the uh, sure. the Highlands. The, the way I like to describe this is. If you take a look at Scotland, all right, uh, look at the West Coast. And of course, over there, you've got that little tiny island called Isla, mm -hmm. uh, which has got all those iconic distilleries there, Beaumont and uh, Lagavulin and Elfroig and Ardbeg and all those wonderful guys. And then you go to the center of Scotland, up in the Highlands, who some of those guys are making peaty whiskey. I mean, we have Spey Fumari, which is a peated version. Mm -hmm. The big difference is, where did they get their peat? Mm -hmm. So the peat on the western side that's harvested has got all that salt, that iodine, because of the proximity to the ocean, right? Mm -hmm. As compared to the peat that's harvested in the center or up in the highlands, there's no iodine. Yeah. So where do you, where you use your peat or where you harvest your peat is going to determine some of that profile. Yeah. So if if anybody has ever tasted um, uh, Benaromic, mm -hmm. they do a light peating. It's Highland peat. Yeah. As compared to Lafroig. Yeah. Who does Isla peat? And so I, I tend to get out of the Highlands a little bit more of a heathery kind exactly. of a... Exactly. So it's, so it's what you're... It, all it is is compacted dirt. Yeah. And so whatever was on the <clears> land <throat> is what you're tasting. Exactly. Decomposed over a period of... It's, so it's very regional. Yeah. It can be very regional. That's part of where you get your differences. So it's also the water source. Mm -hmm. Any distiller will tell you one of the most important elements and where the decisions were made for them hundreds of years ago to build their distillery, it was the water. Yeah. Okay, you had to have clean water. So the water starts the process. 
now we go through all the the mash and we we mash the barley da 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 and go through and you dry it how how do you dry it well if i dry it over uh gas fires down the lowlands mm -hmm. i'm not going to get a lot of flavor i dry it over uh coal fires up in the, the up in the highlands in space side it tended to roast the grain a little bit. Mm. They don't do that anymore now, but I'm going back in history. Yeah, yeah. And that's what really gave you all these differences. People come to me all at the tastings and they'll say, okay, so can you describe a space side? <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> yeah. And how many distilleries are in space side? I mean, there's about 40, 50 exactly. distilleries in that area. Yeah. And, and so you, you know, yeah, everybody wants to try to take it to a region and come up with, with okay, so if I'm from Napa, this is what this is the kind of Cabernet I'm going to get. Yeah. If I'm from Oregon, that's the kind of uh, Pinot Noir I'm going to get. It, it doesn't work that way. Yeah. Um, and it's because of the style, the water source. What did they do with their barley? Uh, then it gets a little more complicated because as you start to ferment your wort, how long did they do the fermentation? Mm. The length of fermentation is going to determine the acidity that you get in your beer. Mm -hmm. The higher your acidity, the longer the fermentation, higher acidity, the more flowery you get out, mm. of, a, out of a malt. Okay. And I, I kind of demonstrate that with our spay. Mm -hmm. Spay is a very flowery, soft malt. Yeah. It's because they ferment their wort for over 100 hours. Mm, wow, that's a long time. Long, long time. Most, yeah. most distillers won't do that. Yeah. The reason they won't because they don't want to get yeast infection in in the uh, in the wort. Yeah. Which is can happen. Yeah. You get a bad yeast infection, throw the batch out. Mm. So I wonder how much they uh, how do they <clears throat> temper that issue? Well, just watching at, it at at spay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're very very careful. They clean everything extensively yeah I mean it's it's really a process well then we go to the pot stills and so and I saw a poster and I would love to have a copy of this poster that shows all the different distilleries oh you have it here yeah it's great great poster it shows <laughs> all the different shapes for all the different stills and I almost think that you should carry that along with you when you're doing tastings because you could demonstrate the swan that stills at Glen Morangy and how light a character that that whiskey mm -hmm. has, um, or Old Pulteney where they've got the squatty <clears throat> one that they had to squeeze into the distillery because mm -hmm. they didn't have enough room with the the roof, uh, and that then uh, so you got that, and then you also have the uh, where they put the barrels because I know that. Old Pulteney picks up a very salty kind of a character to it. Yeah. And it is right in a little fishing village. Yep. Wick, Scotland. So, well, you, you go back to the stills. There's really, the stills are all copper. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, there's been distilleries over the years. Hiram Walker uh, over the years uh, uh, experimented with other metals. Didn't work. Mm -hmm. You have to have copper. And there's three reasons for copper. Number one, copper is the best transfer of heat. Everybody knows that, right? Number two, uh, there's actually trace elements of copper that are in the malt that help us in the aging process. Mm -hmm. So copper is a, is a component of single malt. But three, most importantly, copper attracts heavy sulfurs. Mm -hmm. So the, you use Glenmorangie. The longer exposure to the copper, the more stripping goes on, mm. the lighter your malt. The shorter still doesn't have all that copper, the heavier, creamier mm -hmm. your malt. And then you also have the line arm and they can the, run that either up or down yep. off the top of the still, which yep, can exactly. affect the... Exactly. Yeah. So the line arm, the angle of the line arm will determine uh, how much of that flux we pull off the yeah. still. Yeah. Uh, people always ask, what is flux? Flux is, um, it's, it's the element that you get when you change the direction of the distillate. Mm. Uh, best example I can use. So I import um, uh, um, Eden Mill gin mm -hmm. from St. Andrews, Scotland, okay? 
when they put the stills in, they were actually Portuguese um, uh, uh, brandy stills. Mm. And when they came in to put them in, the installers, the guys who were putting them in, after they put the still in, they went around with a ball peen hammer and they pounded <laughs> the whole thing. That's flux. Okay. You change the direction yeah. of, the, of the distillate. Okay. Now, when we get into the aging process, this is something where when people go look for scotch, mm -hmm. they will sometimes tend to look at the age of the whiskey and try to make a determination on quality. Same thing going on in, in the bourbon market. I can tell you with the, with the bourbon market, um, I'm very leery of, of age statements that are a little high because I feel like there's a point of diminishing returns where if you don't like an overly oaky whiskey after it's gotten a bourbon has gotten past 10 years you're starting to get into questionable territory depending on what the mash bill is and whether it's how it's being treated in the warehouse and the rest but we get used to seeing I just saw yesterday somebody post a picture of a 33 year old Lafroig, and I'm thinking I had the 15-year-old Lefroy, and I did not like it as much as I like the 10-year-old Lefroy because I love the smoke in that whiskey, and the longer it sits in the barrel, the less of that smoke. Although, I've also had an Ardbeg that was 22 years old, and the aggression that's in Ardbeg 10 that for me is a little overwhelming is tamed down perfectly for me in their 22 year old so talk about age statements and and your thoughts on whether they're important uh and how you use those in terms of of a buying decision well drew you're you're exactly right because the longer it sits in the barrel uh the softer they become there's a lot of chemical reaction that's going on between the wood and what's in the the, the malt itself um that, that's kind of marrying together. The way I like to kind of describe it, um, if, if you've ever had, you know, you've gone to taking your garbage bag out to the garbage pail mm -hmm. and it's been sitting out in that uh, 90 degree sun for a couple of days and you open up that garbage pail and phew, wow, <laughs> that's putric acid. Ah, uh, okay. And you get putric acid when you distill. Now, the bad part about it is it smells like garbage, mm -hmm. right, at the beginning. The good part about it is when it finally marries with all the other things, that's where the fruity component comes, is that putric acid has now been converted and changed by the wood, by the aging process, into that nice fruity flavor mm -hmm. that we're looking for, okay? And yes, you're right. The longer it sits in the barrel, the softer it becomes and it can pick up too much wood. It's interesting because um, I, we talked about the largest uh, consumer uh, in terms of volume of Scotch whiskey is France. Mm -hmm. Well, interesting enough, Italy will not buy Scotch whiskey that's much more than six or seven years old. Really? And the reason is, is because they want that bright flavor. Uh -huh. They're looking for that bright flavor. Yeah you lose that as you start to pick up those ages. And with some people, if that's their taste profile, that's great, Yeah, wonderful. Uh, myself, I want the bright flavor. I'm looking for, uh, and you used uh, uh, the Isla Whiskey as a good example with Ardbeg. Ardbeg 10 year old to me, phew, you can't give me enough peat. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but that's my, that's my palate. Yeah, well I love the five. The Wee Beastie is, uh, it, it's more aggressive. <laughs> yes, it shows a little youth on it, but it's the, the peat is full and, and in your face. So we were talking a little bit about um, uh, sherried whiskeys. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at Signatory, we did a, sh a heavy sherried Bonhaven. Mm. It was delicious. Yeah. Absolutely delicious. But it's soft. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's forget about any. Of course, Bunnhaven is very light anyhow. Yeah. 
but forget about any trace of peat whatsoever. It was just, it's gone. Yeah. Well, and they're one of those distilleries that they really only do like one peat peated whiskey a year at the end of the year. And the only reason they do that is because they kept getting complaints of, you're an Isla distillery, why aren't you using peat? Right. And they said, oh, well, you know, okay, we'll do it. We'll do it. And then we'll clean everything out over the winter and be back and up and running. I, I think they probably had a disagreement with uh, uh, Port Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so when we're talking about the... Um, the age statements, and then moving on into uh, finishing of, of barrels now, because that has become prevalent throughout mm -hmm. the industry. And you, you mentioned sherry, and for the longest time, sherry seemed to be the main barrel that was being used. And now we're going for all sorts of different port finishes, and uh, I've seen rum finishes now, and... Mm -hmm. I even saw Glen Allocky did a rye <coughs> barrel, which I've heard over and over, rye and scotch don't mix. But what I tasted in their eight-year-old was pretty impressive. So um, it, what have you seen in terms of the evolution of that? And uh, Yeah, that's uh, it's been pretty dramatic. Obviously, the history, uh, and most people know this, but the history of sherry itself. Mm -hmm. uh, sherry barrels were, uh, sherry was being produced in Jerez in Spain. Okay, sherry then would be shipped up in barrels to England where sherry back in the mid 1800s was the beverage of choice. And of course the bottlers would be bottling all this stuff up and they would be uh, bringing these sherry barrels in, discarding the sherry barrels. Well, the Scotsman knows what to do with the free barrels, so <laughs> up, to, up to Scotland it went, and they started aging their whiskey in this, and that's how it all started. Yeah. And that became very, very popular. So the majority of the Scotch whiskeys way back in those, those days were sherry barrels. Yeah. Um, we didn't have bourbon then. Right. Well, and, and it was harder to ship all the way across the Atlantic rather yeah, exactly. than, yeah, sure. you take what you can get your hands on. <clears throat> exactly. So um, over the course of time, uh, it became a regulation by the, um, the European Union that all the sherry had to be bottled in Hedes. So the sherry barrels weren't available anymore. Uh, and that was the evolution of then the bourbon barrel. Yeah. Uh, and that would have been probably about the mid mid 1900s range okay area. which which is perfect timing for the 1935 <clears throat> law that said one use american barrel yes and that then exactly had a huge supply of barrels yep. to scotland but isn't it funny that now it's flipped completely in the opposite direction for sherry that now they're dumping the sherry to sell the barrels. Yes. They're right. just using it as a seasoning agent yeah, at, at exactly. this point. Because sherry consumption's dramatically down. Yeah. Uh, worldwide. And people are just not consuming sherry anymore. Yeah. And so, yes, that's what they're doing. I, I know McAllen has got programs with the sherry producers, um, specific sherry producers that will produce the barrels for them and do the aging and so on and so forth. Uh, but then you've got all these other things. I mean, we we're doing some experimental stuff ourselves with J.W. Kelly. We bought some Amarone casks, mm -hmm. and we are aging our bourbon in the Amarone casks. So explain uh, Amarone. Where uh, did those come um, from? Amarone is a, an Italian red wine. Okay, comes from the northern portion of Italy. Mm -hmm. uh, the wine's made out of the Corvina grape. What they do is Amarone is kind of an interesting wine. What they do is they take the grapes and they'll put them on racks up in the barns and mm -hmm. they'll let those grapes dry to raisins. They take those raisins and squeeze that juice, make the wine out of it. Mm -hmm. Real intense. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's high, it's high alcohol, typically about 16, 17% alcohol because of all the sugar. Yeah. Uh, but you've got a big, massive wine, mm -hmm. uh, red wine, delicious, absolutely delicious. Amarone wines are very expensive. Yeah. A good one's probably 60, 70 bucks a bottle. 
So this is this is a small release for you. You're probably not buying a ton of those barrels. We're, we're certainly not. <laughs> <laughs> those barrels are expensive. So were you doing that for your bourbon or for your rye? The bourbon. For the bourbon. Okay. Yeah. Did you test I, I'm it? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It was the rye. It was the rye. It okay. was the, the Melrose. Yeah. We I was were, gonna say it'd be interesting because uh, rye has those herbally character that herbally yeah. characteristic. To me, it's. Um, where bourbon can sometimes be heavy handed or really kind of take up the whole picture and it becomes harder to get those uh, delicate flavors out of this or that. Rye right. seems to, you know, invite that, I think, in, in a lot yeah, of ways. Yeah, it, it worked pretty well. Yeah. Yeah, it worked pretty well. But uh, again, with the experimentation that the distillers, the scotch distillers are doing, they're starting to step out Yeah. and, and experiment with some things. I even heard of a, what, uh, one distiller was using some tequila barrels. Mm, yeah. Should be interesting. Yeah. And I've heard that being done in Texas too. So yeah. it's uh, this experimentation is all yeah. over the globe, which is great because it just, for us, it gives us more choices. It's like uh, when my dad used to say, you know, he, he would, he'd say, you walk in the grocery store and you go down the cereal aisle and there's like 10,000 different types of cereal now. We had cornflakes. <laughs> or Wheaties or you know you pretty pretty much were down to just a couple of boxes on the shelf back then and whiskey has gone the same way now <clears> to where we are really in a golden age with variety of different types of, of whiskeys. But again it goes back to your point that you were talking about earlier for a consumer to be able to get all that stuff. Yeah. It's a challenge. It is. It is. But I think people are <clears throat> there's a certain segment that all of this uh, refined, finished whiskey hits. And they're the ones who are, are gonna be seeking and, and going for those. And there's always gonna be that, I call them the Budweiser drinkers. They're, mm -hmm. they're always gonna take the label they know mm -hmm. and it's what they always drank <clears throat> and that's what they're gonna stay with. And so, you know, uh, I guess it's just dividing up those, those pallets and figuring out who really wants to investigate and who just wants to throw something on ice and drink it well in terms of the covid that we just went through this past year year and a half looks like further yeah um that that consumer base that you're talking about um they that hurt us yeah because <clears throat> you couldn't go into a store you had to call in your order and people calling in their order are going to order their comfort brands they didn't know uh, McLeod's. They didn't know uh, uh, Smokehead. They didn't know Spay. They yeah. didn't know all these brands. So yeah, that's that. That had a big effect on us. Yeah. The first place I heard of Smokehead was in Glasgow, Scotland. Huh. I, I stepped into a bar and I saw it back on the back shelf, and I saw a skull and Isla, and I went, "Oh, that looks interesting. I'm gonna have to try that." So that that was my first go round with it. Now you've expanded the line because back then I think all you had was the 43 percent. Right. Um, and so as we <clears throat> start talking about maybe we'll start with with that because you have a lot of the stuff we've talked about represented in there between finishing and uh, the one thing we haven't really talked about is the proof. And I think a lot of people get hooked on proof as I want higher proof so that I get more flavor out of it. Uh, there are others who are, I'd rather have what the master distiller feels is the right proofing for this and I'll, I'll taste it wherever it, it comes in. Do you have, do you have any kind of theories on that or uh, how people should pay attention to proofing levels on a, on a whiskey? Well, the way I like to explain that is for sure when you have uh, a proofed down whiskey, mm -hmm. 86, 80 proof, 40%, uh, wh whatever it is, you're, you're going to have to lose flavor. It's, it's just something that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. As compared to a cast strength where nothing is done to it, it's taken out of the barrel and put in the bottle, natural. Yeah. Uh, all the flavors are there. So uh, the downside of the high proof, it becomes more expensive. Yeah. Uh, if people don't understand it and understand that you have high proof, 
you probably do have to add a little bit of your water, right. which is okay. Yeah, that's fine. Um, and and I think that's probably where some of the biggest problems are. Yeah, there are a few people when when I do tastings around the country that come to me and say, "I'm looking for cast strength. Mm -hmm. I want high proof," and they get it. They understand. But that's one person out of. 25 or 30 yeah. that, are, that are in that group. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but I can I can definitely tell you uh, in this smokehead, and I use this as a great example. So the regular smokehead, which is uh, 86 proof, or yeah, 86 proof, 43% as compared to what they call their high voltage. Mm -hmm. The high voltage is the cast strength. That's 58%, 116 proof. Okay, now that has been stabilized because every cask, every barrel of whiskey is going to be a little bit different in proof, mm -hmm. right? So you will have to stabilize a bit, yeah. but it's just minimal. minimal. Yeah. So it's 116 proof, but you taste the two of these side by side, it's amazing the difference. Well, and one of the things that is different about distilling in Kentucky and Tennessee versus Scotland is that proofs go up as they age in Kentucky and Tennessee. So when you see, because I, I had this question on Johnny Walker Blue, somebody said, well, it's 40, it's 40 uh, or 80 proof. You know, that's uh, well, why they keep watering it down like that. And I said, if they're using 20, 30, 40, 50 year old whiskey in there, they have to rescue that barrel before it drops below the minimum for Scotch whiskey, which would be 80 proof. Mm -hmm. And it's because it's just losing that proof over time. So the older your whiskey in Scotland, the lower the proof it's going to be, your cast strength would, would be. And so what's interesting is that I, I've noticed that when they're doing cast strength bottlings, they're usually non age stated whiskeys uh yes and yeah. it, and it's going to be because they will use multiple barrels and of course the rule over there is the youngest barrel in the vatting claims the age mm -hmm. so yeah if i've got if i've got a barrel that's five years old and i'm putting it into seven or eight 12 year old casts it's now five years yeah just interesting because we some people do get hung up on the proof of a whiskey and understanding that difference will help you understand that whiskey is different all over the world. Yes. And so you have to really deal with whatever the, the, the weather climate is going to, Oh yeah. You know, due to a whiskey. Well, so. you, you mentioned earlier about, um, uh, a barrel sitting next to the ocean, mm -hmm. okay, as compared to a barrel sitting in the the highlands, as compared to a barrel sitting down the lowlands, um, location because those barrels are breathing. Yeah, they are breathing their environment. And if I've got a barrel sitting right next to the ocean, it's going to get that salt sea air. Yeah, that's what's that's what's going to happen to that barrel, uh, be, because you you know we talk about the loss of a barrel. And, and generally, the, ru the rough uh, formula is 5 plus 2. 5% of the barrel you lose the first year. It's mm -hmm. just to swell it up, get it tight so it's not leaking anymore. 2% each year thereafter. Mm. So in a 10-year-old barrel, you're going to lose about 25% of the fill, roughly. Yeah. That, and that's what's going to happen. Well, as that thing evaporates out, what replaces the space? Air. The air. Yeah. Of where it lives. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, my perfect example of that is when you, when I was at Beaumont, one of the people that was on the tour with me, we were standing outside and they were sipping one of their sample bottles. And he said, it's so funny because I usually get like a, a sea air component to this that I'm really not picking up. And then the light bulb went off in his head and he said, oh, wait, I'm, I'm surrounded by that smell. You're already there. Yeah, you're in it. And that's what I love um, because when I went to uh, Lagavulin or I go to Lefroig, and then I'm home <clears throat> drinking it now, it almost transports me back. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's like a time machine and it takes <clears throat> me right back to the spot where, I, and, and I think that's one of the things that when you first start out drinking scotch, 
or if you don't travel and get a chance to see these places, you you miss that element that it mm-hmm. really is a product of its environment very much and can really tell the tale of, of where it came from. Um, so talk about the Smokehead. And so this has been around for about how long? Uh, Smokehead we launched, I'm trying to remember, uh, that would have been uh, about 2001, 2002, 2003. Uh, that was the regular Smokehead. Mm-hmm. Uh, quite recently, uh, two years ago, they launched the high voltage and then just most recently, it's now the Sherry Bomb and just came in the Rum Rebel. Mm. So you talked about rum casks. Yeah. That's exactly what they're doing. Okay. They've taken Isla whiskey, which is kind of unusual, yeah. and put it into a rum cask. It's, uh-huh. it's a Caribbean rum cask. Interesting. So it's, uh, it's probably picking up some sweetness out of that. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, you know, and again, I, I think I mentioned this earlier, I'm, I'm a purist when it comes to single malt. I want all the bright, uh, smoky, peaty flavor. Yeah. I don't want you to tone it down for me. <laughs> so it's, it's, although I can appreciate the Sherry Bomb, it's really not one of my favorites. Yeah. It's too sweet. Uh, uh, they, they've, they've just almost masked completely the peat. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I love the high voltage because that is just dramatic. Yeah. Um, but this new Rum Rebel, when I tasted it, it was an interest. It was interesting. It was a good balance of peat mm-hmm. and that sweetness. Mm. It was a perfect balance. Okay. And, and see with the uh, sherry and peat mix, there really is a fine balancing act oh, big, there big time it's uh it's the same issue i see with people who are trying to distillers that are trying to use port barrels because if you leave it in that port barrel just a little too long it suddenly becomes whatever that port barrel was i had somebody doing madeira and when they did it uh he said well we left it in there a little too long because he said i'll give you a sample but it basically tastes like madeira <laughs> here's a great example so this is from Spay. Okay. Uh, that is a dark it, whiskey. Okay, let me let me explain it because this is Tanay, okay, which is tawny. All okay? right. It's Latin for tawny. They put it into a tawny port cask. Mm-hmm. They left it too long. <laughs> Way too long. Yeah, I mean, if to, you can't see this, but it is. It's black. It looks like um, grape juice. (laughs) It is dark grape juice. That's amazing. So, as compared to the one that was done properly. Ah, oh, that's dramatically different. So, what do you think the? Was done right. Yeah, because this one is. uh, I I I tend to rate color on what I call the Walker scale because zero is Johnny Walker. Okay. Because that is what <clears throat> Diageo believes is the color that people accept as the color of whiskey. And then I go minus from there, or I go plus if it's if it's darker. So this is actually color-wise right in that Johnny Walker mm-hmm. range versus grape juice. <laughs> <laughs> and it's the same. But so <clears throat> it really is up to the distiller to go in there and check it. Frequently watch, to make sure that watch it's... Watch the barrels. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because just different weather conditions could probably speed it up or well, slow it down. It's also first fills, second fills. Yeah. I mean, uh, the the uh, length of time in this particular case, did they use that for Tawny Port? Yeah. How old was that barrel and how active is it? Mm. So if I get a very active barrel, I don't need a lot of time in there. Yeah. As compared to a less active barrel, a little more time, but you're not you're going to get a better balance. Yeah. So there's a there's a subtlety in that um, one that has been watched versus the one that just kind of got to soak in as much of the barrel as it could. <laughs> it, it's an art to it. Yeah. There, it's definitely an art, and that's the distiller. That's his responsibility. Yeah. Is to watch that. Sure. So talk about some of the other uh, brands you have here, and where these generally are it, it, whether it's easier to say where they are available or where they're not available because uh, these are brands i have not seen on my shelf in south carolina 
And as you say, those are <coughs> probably the more control states. It'll be harder to get some of these. Yeah, we're we're in open states. So the open states, uh, Minnesota, uh, New York. Um, I think Georgia, is Georgia open? Georgia's open. Okay. Georgia, Tennessee, obviously, because we're here. Yeah. Missouri, California. New York. Uh, Colorado. Um, as I said Minnesota, Wisconsin. Yeah. Okay. Um, open states. Tex yeah, yeah. Texas, we're, we're, we're very active in Texas. Okay. With uh, a retailer there called Specs. Okay. And so describe these because one of these you were talking about when we think about blended whiskeys. Yeah. Um, there's a technique used here that I've been preaching about a bit <laughs> on my tasting videos and also been dropping some hints about <clears throat> in my conversations with distillers about how this is finished and not not finishing in terms of uh the barrel it's right. put in but what happens to that the, the bottling spirit. process yeah right yeah you're you're talking about chill filtering so and and that's true for bourbon mm -hmm. okay for most whiskeys especially brown spirits any brown spirit is going to have to go through some sort of chill filtering and the reason for it is very simply when you distill your product there are natural fats and oils what we refer to as esters mm -hmm. that are actually in the whiskey those are the flavoring agents right the problem that you have when you start adding water to the to the distilled spirit when it comes out of the barrel as you add the water and you get down to uh, it's right about 90 proof 90 89 in that range uh, you start adding water, uh, those esters come out of solution. Mm. And the esters will get cloudy. The water has now created this cloudiness. So you, consumers are not going to buy cloudy whiskey. <laughs> so what has to happen, they will chill it down. Mm -hmm. They typically, it depends on the production. Some of the companies will go to 32 degrees. Okay, that's pretty severe. Yeah. But when you're you're bottling thousands and thousands of cases of Johnny Walker red or whatever it is yeah you're gonna to have to get pretty severe so they'll take it down to 32 degrees they then pass it through a filter pad which strips out the cloudiness that then is clears up the whiskey well the problems are obvious we just stripped out half your taste profile <laughs> so unchill filtered is a little more difficult because you you are gonna get cloudy yeah so what in, in what you referred to is we just launched this new brand it's called clan mcleod mm -hmm. and clan mcleod is a blended scotch whiskey now again blended scotch whiskey is where you take single malt and you add grain whiskey we add the two together that that's where the term blended scotch whiskey came from mm -hmm. okay so typically blended scotch whiskeys like Johnny Walker, Dewars, uh, uh, Jane B, Cuddy Sark, all those guys. Uh, there's a certain amount of single malt to to grain, and they have their formulas, but they're all going to have to go to chill filtering because they usually tick them down to either 80 proof or 86 proof. Mm -hmm. Well, what they decided to do, Clam McLeod came out, or McLeod, uh, Ian McLeod. Uh, they launched this brand called Clam McLeod, which is 92 proof. Uh, just before the hazing starts yeah and they didn't chill filter and so you're actually getting a blended scotch whiskey that's going to be a higher proof and unchill filtered which is not something you're going to get out of a johnny walker or no. doer or right. because those are well and and i've heard that the reason that they do it i say it's about education and it's about letting the consumer know that a hazy whiskey actually isn't a bad whiskey it's a better whiskey <laughs> actually yeah. yes yes or if you as you showed me a bottle of jw kelly that ended up with a little sediment in the bottom of the barrel hey it's still maybe it's aging a little bit in there still you know you you got uh you, you got something going on it's not able to breathe but uh unless you open the bottle but well you take that bottle and shake it up yeah okay you're going to disperse all the esters back in the in the whiskey you taste that compared to the one that's been uh, filtered heavily. Yeah. Oh, there, there's a difference in the flavor for yeah. sure. Yeah. You, you'll yeah. taste the difference. Yeah. All you, 
um, years ago, um, I owned a distributorship in Missouri for 16 years. Um, and we launched, we were the third, third distributor in the country to launch Four Roses. Mm. When Four Roses re relaunched in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And uh, Jimmy Rutledge was the uh, master distiller at the time. Uh, and I was over talking with him and we were talking, he took me to the, the bottling hall and he was showing me the bottling process and all that stuff. And they were dumping the barrels and I'm, I'm going, ah, this is great. And all of a sudden over in the corner, I saw the chill filter. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> he said, well, I, I said, you're not. He, he said, Ed, you have to. Yeah. You have to. So I guess even with his cream of Kentucky now, he's probably chill filtering that as, as well, maybe. Well. We won't speak the, for him, but the, the, the main brands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the main brands are. Yeah. Can they do? It? And you mentioned Al. Uh, yeah, Al Young. Yeah. yeah. God bless. Yeah. Al uh, was mentioning a, a special bottling that they did. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah. Sure, you can do that. Yeah. Just like this. Yeah. It's it's fun actually <laughs> now seeing that Jim Beam went back and brought their old name back, <clears throat> old tub, <clears throat> which is what it originally was. Right. And they did it in big letters, unfiltered. So it's catching on. And when the big guys, because I've, I've, I've heard Fred No say, you know, we're, we're not really looking, we're looking to sell a lot of whiskey. And so we don't want anything to detract from us being able to sell a lot of whiskey. And I get that. But even he's open to trying it out and seeing how it works. And most of the people that I've talked to who have tasted that whiskey really like that whiskey. So. I think over the last probably 15 years, um, I have done anywhere from 60 to 80 single malt tastings per year mm -hmm. around the country. And invariably, people will come to me and say, when are you going to do cast strength whiskey? Mm. I mean, it's, every, the, people are getting it. There's an awareness now. They, they're getting it. Yeah. And I was talking to about Unchill Filtered years ago. And at that time, <laughs> people didn't have a clue what I was talking <laughs> about. And, and I, do a, I do a PowerPoint presentation where I actually show them the chiller and I show them the filter. This, yeah. this is how it works. This is what happens. And they still didn't get it. <laughs> but people are starting to get it now. Yeah. Thank God. Yeah. Well, you mentioned it enough. And I think the more we get into this social media world where people are sharing tasting notes and you're seeing more podcasters who are doing tasting notes and really focusing on that, and people are just leisurely listening to this, but they keep hearing it over and over and over again. <laughs> Sooner or later, it will start to drill into their head that maybe this is something I should pay attention to when grabbing a bottle of whiskey off the shelf. So, I, will I will make a prediction. Okay. So we launched this 92 proof, unchill filtered, blended scotch whiskey. Mm -hmm. You watch the big boys. <laughs> and see, well, because you were mentioning to me that this actually uh, comes in at a price point that's lower than Johnny Walker Red. Well, and, and that has a lot to do with, yes, uh, the, the bottle of this is on the shelf at about sixteen ninety nine a bottle. Yeah. I mean, the value is really there for sure. Yeah. This almost tastes like a single malt. I mean, it's that close. Now, is this? Does this have any uh, smoke to it, or is it? Uh, well, they've got two styles. Yeah, they've got two styles. Okay. They've got one here called Smooth and Mellow. Okay. This will not have any peated whiskey in it. Yeah. Uh, and then they've got one Bold and Spicy. Okay. This definitely is going to have the peaty whiskey. These these could be trainer scotches, really. Pretty in, much. In terms of here's your chance to <clears throat> really get a sense of. All right, I've been the bourbon drinker for a while. Mm -hmm. Let me move on over and see. And it's not a huge price point. It's not a huge price point. Yeah. And for those people, I would suggest definitely the smooth and mellow. That's the way. Because the, the spicy one has got some Peak got some guts smoke to, it. to it. Yeah. 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 Right. And then the others, the McLeods and the... Uh, yeah. The, these oh. are kind of beginner malts, if you will. Okay. Okay. Um, and we're actually going to be adding two more. So we've got right now a Highland a space side and an Isla. Okay. 
uh, the three basic styles. Yeah. Uh, we're going to be adding lowland mm -hmm. and island. Okay. So we'll have five different styles. Yeah. But these are all single malts. Uh, the unique part here is it's called McLeod's. Mm -hmm. owned, it's produced by Ian McLeod. Uh, but we won't name the distillery. Okay. So they're single malts. Yeah. But we're not going to name the distillery. And, and the same with Smokehead. S not going to name the distillery. So what's fun about <clears throat> this is that you get to taste it. And if you know a lot of Isla distilleries, maybe you'll be able to guess which one it is. I see a lot of that on online whenever we run into a situation like that. Lots of speculation. Some people think they've nailed it. And um, I did a tasting out in California where I had tasted a bunch of pre-prohibition whiskey. Mm -hmm. And one of the whiskeys I tasted had a heavy banana note to it. And I thought, the whiskey that stands out to me that has that is Jack Daniels. And I thought, am I drinking a pre-prohibition version of Jack Daniels, but like these bottles, we'll never know. Or well, somebody knows. Uh, oh, yeah. In that case, nobody will ever know because yeah. it's just coming out of a, a carboy that had a tag on it that's a very good old whiskey. Well, what, what's interesting to me, and, and of course they won't tell me yeah. the malts that they use, um, but it's interesting to me that in Highland, uh, McLeod, or, uh, Ian McLeod owns a Highland distillery. Okay. And they also, in Speyside, they also own a Speyside distillery. Mm. They don't own an Isla distillery. <laughs> uh, so I can kind of pretty well figure out which ones they're using. Yeah, yeah. Uh, right. Yeah. But, you know, the big advantage of this is uh, these are about $36 on the shelf. Mm -hmm. So price points are really good Yeah. in, in terms of, of value. It's single malt. Yeah. Uh, the other thing they don't they don't do is they won't put an age statement on there. Okay. And and again, uh, regulation is if you're going to put an age statement on there, the youngest barrel claims the age, right? Yeah. And I can tell you they're probably six or seven eight year old malts. Okay. In these in these vattings. Yeah. But you wouldn't want to put a six year old uh, age statement on there. Yeah. Well, I. But I think that's another thing that's an education for the consumer because I've had. Uh, Glen Scotia, I went to the distillery. They gave me whiskey straight off the still. Mm -hmm. And it was so fruity and had such a great flavor to it that when I got back home and I said, oh man, the, the youngest I can get is 15 year. I hope it hasn't you know killed off all that flavor. This is where the master blender, master distiller comes into play because it still had those early characteristics to it. But you could tell the maturity of the the barrel as well, and it was a nice balance of those. So it, yeah, for me, I'm not really that experience taught me that age statements really don't tell the tale. They don't. Yeah, none at all. So, and, and again, people have been taught over here twelve years, mm -hmm. and I think that goes back to the uh, Chevis Regal days. When they when Chevis Regal was really being promoted by Seagram's, yeah, it was a twelve year old Scotch, right? And that's where it got it in their heads. Twelve years is is the benchmark. Yeah, yeah. It's not. <laughs> it's not. So one other thing um, before we wrap up, we we're talking about J W Kelly and have mentioned it a few times. How did you uh, come to get into from being an importer to actually having your own whiskey brand? Well, it was actually my grandson who uh, discovered the history and story of J.W. Kelly, mm -hmm. who actually was a guy. That, you know, one of the problems that you run into with, in our industry, in our business, um, people will come up with this fictitious names and uh, whatever it is and come up with a story. This is actually a guy who was actually born and raised in Ireland. Mm. And he moved, he was, in, he was born in Waterford, Ireland, from what we've been able to find out. He moved to New York as a young man and eventually wound up in Nashville during the Civil War and became a rectifier, mm -hmm. where he was putting together whiskey and brands, and Old Milford was one of his brands that he, that he was selling to the uh, troops and everybody else during the war. Uh, at the end of the war in 1866, he decided to move to Chattanooga where he actually opened up his first distillery, mm. the first distillery being opened after the Civil War. 
and that was called uh, J.W. Kelly Deep Springs Distillery. Mm, okay. And it was right down there on Broad Street. I mean, we've got record of it in the whole nine yards. He's been um, uh, put into, in fact, he was in the newspaper back in, 18, I think it was 1883, mm -hmm. was in a newspaper as being one of the top individuals in Chattanooga yeah. in terms of, of helping open up libraries and banks and stuff. He was doing very well. He had he had money coming in. He had money coming in. He was doing very well. And this was a distillery town at one point. Yes. I think it was upwards time. of some 30 maybe distilleries in yes. this area over time. Right. So Because of the water. Mm. The yeah. water. Yeah. And the river w allowed them to take their goods to various markets. Yeah. But so you, you've got big distilling here. Well, Anyway, he started up, we found this. He disappeared because prohibition put him out of business. Mm. Mm -hmm. He eventually disappeared. Uh, we found the history and decided, wow, this needs to be redone. Yeah. And that's how we started. We started this in 2017. And uh, last time I was here, I got a chance to, to sample some and we went back and my favorite, uh, my favorite one is one that you don't really sell, which was you're doing for a restaurant, I think. It was the moon pie. <laughs> <laughs> so I've, I've learned since I've been in Tennessee about sun drop and moon pies. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> moon pies are a tradition here. Yeah. So, and it was a barrel <clears throat> that I guess it held yes. moon pies and right. then you, you finished off in it. And it was really, for anybody who's had a a moon pie. I mean, it's kind of like marshmallow yeah, and mar yeah. graham cracker and right. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I've had even the banana ones. You probably didn't use the banana ones, I'm no. guessing. <laughs> we only had that one barrel. Yeah, yeah. So that was very interesting. So that's great. And where is that distributed? Pretty much the same states as you're you're doing yeah. your yeah uh, yeah. We're we're fairly good. We're we're in um, uh, 36 states. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing your wealth of knowledge on Scotch whiskey and introducing a lot of people. The, the barriers are the names, sometimes, being able to pronounce them. Yeah, the Gaelic stuff, Kalila. Yeah, Ooh, yeah. That's a tough one. I, and actually, I did a bunch of pronunciation videos out on YouTube, <clears throat> and I just did their 10-second videos. And I, I took them from all the distilleries I visited and heard them pronounced there. <laughs> and I still get people arguing with me that they're not, that I'm not pronouncing them, but I say Kalila. And uh, they're like, no, if you watch this guy named Brian Cox, actor Brian Cox, they say he's Scottish and he says it's Kalila. <laughs> and I'm like, no, 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 it's not. I'm sorry. I don't know how I argue against a, a Scotsman, <laughs> uh, me, Mr. American, but I say I went to the distillery and this is uh, probably the one that's most confusing uh, still for me is, is it Bomore or Bomore? Bomore. Because there they'll say Bomore, but then I heard one of their um, people on a different tour uh, who was a tour guide for them on a, on a tour at another distillery. And she said, no, we're just trying to get people to say Bull Moore now. And, and so it's what everybody says. So stick with it. But, uh, Glenn, Glenn Murray, uh, it's looks like Glenn Mori. So people say, it, call it that. And so I, I get arguments on that yeah. too, but yeah. it's like, I, I can't do it with a Scottish accent. So Murray is kind of, a yeah, it, it's subtle in how you, make it more Murray than right. Moray. So, yeah. But, uh, yeah. So hopefully talking regions, talking different, uh, styles and, and, uh, learning more about what you got here, uh, helps people get a little better handle on it. So I appreciate Great. your, your help on this. No, thanks for coming in. Sure. Thank you. Appreciate it. And to find out more about the whiskeys that Ed distributes, like Spay, Smokehead, McLeod, Clan McLeod, and his own J.W. Kelly, head to questbrandsinc.com. And if you're new to the podcast, make sure that you subscribe so you don't miss any episodes, and help us grow by telling a friend about the show. And find show notes, transcripts, social media links, books, and swag at whiskey-lore.com. Or support this independent podcast by joining the Whiskey Lore Society at patreon.com slash whiskey lore. I'm your host, Drew Hanish, and until next time, cheers and slanjava. Whiskey Lore The Interviews is a production of Travel Fuels Life, LLC.